in the morning when we wake up, sometimes we notice that our eyes still have the, the sleepy stuff in them. Yes, and we have to do that. Mm-hmm. Yes, have you ever noticed? Yeah. In order to see? Yeah. This is what we're doing. <laughs> this is <Yes>. the <laughs> <laughs> Clearing the eyes. Yes. And of course, the way to see, we discussed yesterday as well, the way to see is with the booty, the intellect, it's with the eye of reason. And so we're clearing it out, clearing the sleepiness out of it. <laughs> oh, okay, let's start with Gita Dhyana. Oh, oh, Bhagavad Gita, by which Arjuna was illumined by Lord Krishna himself, and which was composed of 18 chapters within the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa. O oh, Divine Mother, destroyer of rebirth, who showers the nectar of oneness upon us, O Bhagavad Gita, my affectionate mother, on thee I meditate. All the Upanishads are the cows. The milker is the cowherd boy, Krishna. Arjuna is the calf. And people of purified intellect are the drinkers. My salutations to the Lord, who is the source of supreme bliss, whose grace makes the mute eloquent, and the crippled cross, cross mountains. Hari Om Dross, dross, clearing the dross from the intellect, from the faculty of reason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Om. I just realized I don't. Mm. I just, I actually don't know what Bhagavad Gita means. Son of God, dear. Bhagavad mm. is God. One of the names, Bhagavad, Bhagavan. Mm. Mm. Um, Ishvara, there are many, you know, countless names. Umadevi. Mm. <laughs> so it could just as easily be Umadevi Gita. And Gita is the song. Um, Gita. Um, Gita. <laughs> the song. Okay. song. Bhagavad is a generic name, not a specific name okay. for God. It's not a specific um, aspect of it. Uh, and it's sung. And it's sung. And it's sung. Just like the the cosmic music it's danced to or it's sung sanskrit is a chanted language it's not a spoken language Uh, and there's a we can say that there's a reason for that now this is just applying logic and working it out and seeing seeing how it works because how to how to transmit um during the darker times, you know, most most every teaching in um, all of the highest teachings in every tradition, most of them have been trampled on in some way, have been adapted and changed. And the Holy Bible is very much a committee work. <laughs> uh, um, and so we have the Gospels, which are quite pure, and then a lot of committee work in between. Um, we have um, Sermon on the Mount, which is quite pure and quite prescient. And in in all of the traditions, there's something like this. There are lost scriptures and all of this, but um, um, but there's something about the Vedic tradition and the Vedic scriptures, and you can see it because the more modern languages, even even Greek, Greek is a spoken language. And when you're, if you're to pass something along when you're not writing, then you have to memorize it very well and pass it along 
in that way. But, but if you look at the psyche when we're dealing with prose, prose spoken, not sung, prose, the tendency is to always embellish, to always add something to it or change it a little bit, to correct it, to fix it. <laughs> and so um, it, it's just, you can see it's actually the way that the psyche works. If, if you tell a story and then pass it along between 10 people and then it comes back to you, will it be word for word exactly the same story as when, it, when you said it the first time? You know it'll be different, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe you've had this experience even. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you've told a story, a joke or something like that and then someone tells you again later mm -hmm. and you hear it and ah, there's something missing. It's not quite the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. So with, with song, um, the lyrics of a song and a, and a chanted or sung verse, it comes back the same. That's the, something about the psyche. Psychologists can try to explain why, but it's, but it's the way this mind works. That, and so you could say that the mind in Sanskrit came together like this. You could make some claim like this and who could deny it? <laughs> who could deny it? Because, the, because if there needs to be a language in order to, to hold something sacred, to hold something precisely, some knowledge, some wisdom that wants to be transmitted, then, and Pali, by the way, is also chanted. Yeah, Pali is also chanted. Pali is a derivative language. It was the common Sanskrit, commoner Sanskrit. Uh, so Buddha spoke Sanskrit, but also the Buddha, but also the people generally spoke a derivative, but still chanted it. Uh, and so he taught in Pali. But, um, but if you wanted something to remain precisely, then you would sing it instead of speaking it in prose. <laughs> Right? Do you still have songs that come into your head 30 years later, 20 years later? Yes. 10 years later, right? And they're the same? Yeah. And so that's Bhagavad Gita. The song of God. So, <coughs> singing. It's not the song about God. Uh, it's a song that Krishna is singing here. So, as, as uh, Arjuna and, um, and Lord Krishna are sitting together there, standing together in the chariot, Lord Krishna is singing. <laughs> and it's chanted, the same words that, that he spoke are now continually chanted in India and anywhere there is the Sanskrit tradition with the Bhagavad Gita and many, many people, many people, thousands, hundreds of thousands in the world every day have a practice of chanting the Bhagavad Gita, or singing the Bhagavad Gita. So the same song that was sung however many thousands of years ago is sung today, every day, every moment it's being sung. And it's precisely the same. The Sanskrit's precisely the same. The translations will vary, but there's never been any change in the Sanskrit in the, actual, in the actual. So the teaching then will get misinterpreted, but it's not actually lost. The same teaching that was given to, to mankind at the beginning of the Kali Yuga is still here right now. And there's actually no other tradition that can say that, interestingly. Yeah. So, so it's quite unique in this way. The teaching is quite unique because it's holistic, you see. Mm -hmm. what, what aspect of life is not dealt with in the Bhagavad Gita? We've been doing this for a while. What aspect of life is not dealt with? <laughs> So it's holistic, it's complete. It's not, it's not just spiritual teaching, it's practical. Mm -hmm. 
really, if applied, it leads to success in any field, any, any field of endeavor. Mm -hmm. ah, and it's a practice of concentration, a teaching of the mind, the psychology, how this mind works. <coughs> what is the relationship between this mind and the light? And the world. Mm -hmm. So, what is it? And so all of this is addressed. How to attain the highest and rest. Huh? So holistic, complete. So the song of God. It's a complete work in and of itself. Although there are many, 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 and we don't we don't uh, denigrate any of the scriptures and any of the traditions. Um, but Bhagavad Gita still stands unique. Because here it is today as a song, still being sung actively, being lived and danced as we speak. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Okay. So let's pick up here, and then there's some commentary to share from some event Kitesh this morning as well. Okay. We back up just a little on the shlokas to get them in order. So now Arjuna is starting to to speak. Arjuna's hair stood on end. Amazed and ecstatic, he fell in adoration before the Lord, pressed his palms together near his heart and spoke, O Lord, I see all the devas in you. Your body contains every living creature in all levels of evolution. Even the creator, Brahma, seated on the lotus and surrounded by the ancient sages and celestial serpents. I see you embodied. So you can you can just if you can relate this way, we've all have different ways of dealing with the universal forms. So if you can actually use your imagination a little bit and just, just see if you can see a little taste of what's being described, that is all of these which seem to be separate objects is actually um, integrated parts of a whole, which is the divine body. There's a there's another term by the way which is this, which is the same body of Christ. We were talking about Christian tradition yesterday, dear Uma Devi. So body of Christ has exactly the same meaning. Usually, if you look, you'll see lower meanings of it. You'll see people interpreting the the phrase body of Christ as meaning the Christians, as opposed to the others. But the Christians are the others. <laughs> Ah, the one who truly follows it all the way comes to Christ consciousness. And Christ consciousness is also Krishna consciousness. Is also Shiva consciousness. And every, it, it refers to the supreme. We forget Christ is not a personal name. Christ means king. King is Lord. So Christ consciousness is the consciousness of the king, which we all share in, which we're all made of. Hmm? When I say my thought, where is my thought? My thought exists in Christ consciousness. <laughs> huh? It's not my thought. It's God's thought. <laughs> and where is it arising from? Consciousness. What consciousness? Christ consciousness. Krishna consciousness. So these terms aren't referring to a personalized version or a personalized aspect or a little piece of. They're actually referring to, to what we're all swimming in. And this entire universe is swimming in. And this entire universe is, is arising and falling and writhing and glowing. And there are the dark corners that we call the black holes and dark energy and, and the light corners where the stars are streaming and the supernovas are exploding. And, um, like this, and so all of this occurring within the one consciousness, which is divine, which is Christ consciousness, which is Krishna consciousness, which is Brahman. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we can visualize a little in the mind's eye. So I see you embodied in an array of countless forms wherever I turn, arms, bodies, mouths and eyes, on and on to infinity, or everywhere you have no end, no middle, no beginning. O Lord of the universe, your body is the entire cosmos. And now I see you crowned with precious gems and holding the mace and discus 
in the midst of a light so radiant that I can hardly stand it. You are like a fiery sun blazing out in all directions. You are what is to be known, the supreme imperishable reality. You are the treasure house of the universe, the refuge of all creatures, and the eternal guardian of the Dharma. Now I understand you are Purusha, the ancient of the ancients. Purusha meaning the spirit, the causeless cause, or the seed of all of the seeds. You reach everywhere. There's no place that you start nor end, no middle either. You wield infinite power. The sun and moon are your eyes. Your mouth is a burning fire that heats the whole universe. From heaven to earth, every quarter is full of your presence. O Mahatman, Supreme Self, the three worlds tremble before your terrifying and marvelous cosmic form. I just want to pick up something from Swami Venkatesh here about He says, God is the inexhaustible treasure house of this universe for the very simple reason that nothing in him is ever destroyed. We have a, we have a concept of a cycle of life, which is, and we say in some traditions, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva which the cycle of life, which is creation, sustenance, and then destruction. And of course, the destruction then leads to creation again, right? That's, um, and in Western tradition, sometimes we'll hear people say, yes, yes, it's true. God means, means generator, G-O-D, generator, observer, destroyer. So, have you heard? It was Swami Ramasarup that had told me that for the first time, and then I've heard it multiple times since. Um, so we call it this. But he says, there is and can only be a change of form or mutation. And science has discovered that actually there's nothing created. So where did it come from is, is this interesting question, which is called singularity. Um, but this is a basic law, a basic understanding that science has come to, that there's actually not creation. So Swamiji says that in, that, in fact, is the meaning of the Sanskrit word nash, to become invisible. So... Uh, he says, we call it destruction for it suits our limited vision and understanding, which means like what I cannot see with the senses, therefore does not exist. But we're coming face to face with a reality that, that is different than that. What I don't see, what I, what I don't touch, what I don't feel, what I don't hear still exists. Right? Mm. So, so nash, meaning invisible. So we got, and the Sanskrit word I don't know, but, but when I was in India the first time, it was someone's birthday. And so Swami doesn't say birthday anymore because I was corrected, of course. <laughs> and what I was told was that the Sanskrit word which, which would get translated as birthday, doesn't mean birthday, it means appearance day. So in Sanskrit, when we go to the ancient Sanskrit language, what we get is there is no word that means creation. The word means to appear. And no word that means destruction, the equivalent word means to disappear. <laughs> so it, it's a deeper way of seeing and again, it's very much consistent with, with, what the, with what the physicists are observing. And that is, there's no creation, but somehow then what previously existed couldn't be seen 
So it wasn't appearing, but it existed. And so here, this is what we're dealing with. This Purusha exists. It is existence itself, Satchitananda. Christ. But it can't be seen. In fact, the senses, the five senses all come from it. So the five senses, therefore, can't see it. They can't see it. This is why the, the Bhuti, Bhuti Yoga is actually the only way. Because as long as you rely upon some physical seeing, it will be like a vision, a dream. And it will be, this is what we were discussing yesterday, right? As long as you say, okay, I'm waiting until you give me the eyes. It's like, well, you'll be waiting for a while because, because it has to be seen in the mind's eye. We're not talking about a vision. We're talking about using the booty to, to work out its existence. And this is what we're coming to here is it still exists, but you cannot see it. It is not manifested, quote unquote, manifested. It's not appeared yet. Mm. But what is the appearance? When you see it, what is the appearance? You see, do you get there? What is the appearance? It's only that which cannot be seen, which appears. So in the before, it could not be seen. Now it can be seen. And then what happens again? And then it cannot be seen. So it's appearing and then disappearing. It's appearing and then disappearing. And it appears in different shapes, different sizes. It appears as both light and dark. And everything in between. It appears as red and green and every other color. Mm. Uh, it appears as Gopala and Swami and Umadevi. And it appears as grass and tree. And then it disappears. And then it becomes invisible again. So visible, it becomes visible, and then it becomes invisible. But, but being visible or invisible, what effect does that have on what is? Nothing. It has no effect on it. If right? it did, it couldn't appear again, right? Ah. That would be it. Oh. If there were actually destruction, there would have to be real destruction. Yeah. But then it would be a very short universe. <laughs> Once everything's destroyed, that's it. That's it. We're done. So, so it remains. I'm just saying it as opposed to he or she right now. Mm -hmm. Right? And maybe it helps in terms of relating. Maybe it doesn't. Because it's not a he or she, but he or she is inclusive in it. <laughs> the only risk of using the word it is it sounds so impersonal, but it's completely personal, supra personal, because every person is of it. So, this vision is a seeing of all of this in the divine, as the divine, and within the divine, oh, within the one reality. No birth, no death. Yeah. yeah, it's the true meaning. There's no birth, no death. I, I've never been born. I've never Everything. died. Nothing. Nothing. Everything. Nothing. 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 Nothing right. dies. Nothing's born. Right. It, it's Body, visible, and then it's invisible, and then it's visible again. But the same essence it is everything of this tree. Yeah. So the five elements are from that essence. They are that essence appearing as the five elements. And what science has discovered that's mind-blowing is that when you get to the subatomic level and you get to the waves and then you get to the strings, you see that the same strings are, what are they observing? Visible and then invisible. Yeah, they just pop in and pop out of existence. Visible? <laughs> invisible. <laughs> Oh, gone. <laughs> and that there's a probability to it. Yeah. But you can't actually put your finger on it. 
You can't ever catch it. <laughs> you can't catch it. Oh. But you're made of it. And so is this. And it's not random. It's not a random appearance. There's certainly laws to it and probabilities to it. So, interesting concept, yeah? Something that we can work with. Uh, visible, invisible. But whether something's visible or invisible doesn't actually change the nature of what sometimes you see and sometimes you don't see. Huh. <clears throat> Arjuna's experience here supports the continuous creation or steady state theory in regard to the universe. God's nature, the vast universe, becomes partly manifest and that manifestation later becomes unmanifest. It does not in any way alter the quantum of his nature, which remains constant. As scientists are saying nowadays, the distribution of the galaxies today is the same as it was millions of years ago and will be the same millions of years hence. They may change place or form, though in infinite space such expressions have no real meaning, but essentially they remain the same. Essentially, in essence, they remain the same. And this is becoming known within physics, modern physics. The sun and the moon being thine eyes, and the subsequent descriptions in verse 19 make us wonder, are we actually seeing parts of God's infinite body and calling it the universe with its diverse classes of existence? Krishna's friends were once entering the mouth of a python saying, look at this mountain cave. Does it not look like the mouth of a python? Are we making the same mistake? When actually looking at the cosmic form of the Lord, are we saying, look at the sun and the moon? They are like the two eyes of the Lord. They are perhaps his eyes. It's like to label me is to deny me. I think I've heard that somewhere. Oh. To define me is to Oh. <clears throat> so this question of seeing why are we not seeing, right? Um, and uh, is it true that we're not seeing? It's not true that we're not seeing. We're seeing what is to be seen. From a physical standpoint, we're seeing what, what can be seen. <coughs> So the issue for us is, is clarity. We're not knowing what we're seeing. We're imagining it to be a thing when in fact it is nothing but the appearance of the Lord. It's not even energy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you call it in some limited way is a is a lessening of what it really is. It's a misunderstanding of what it really is. The unknown. Is that okay? Sorry? The unknown. The Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Can we intellectually know the Lord? Well, why not? In a limited sense. Okay. What is to be known here? I don't know. <laughs> What is to be known? What should be known? Uh, yourself. That's it. Or the Lord. You can say either. You can say either. What else could be known? That's true. If that's all there is, what else could be known? So know that you stories about it. <laughs> stories about it. Uh -huh. So know that you self, you know God. The, the 
Again, you can know about the mystery, you can know of the mystery, you can know that the mystery is all pervasive. You can know that you are yourself the mystery. All of this can be worked out with the intellect. Can you know the nature of the of the mystery? Can you know all of the mysteries within it? No, it remains unknowable. Um, can you know where it came from? Yeah. Hmm. Can you imbibe in it? Yes. Can you serve it? No. Can you integrate with it? Yes. Oh. Can you know where it is? Yeah. Can you know where it is? Which is everything. Wherever you are, right? Yes. Oh. Okay. Um, anyone else comment, question, anything? We'll continue in the morning. Division. My question would be why um, Arjuna freaked out, so he, he's still not seeing correctly, or because otherwise fear wouldn't be there. Again, what is seeing correctly? You're you're equating it with some physical seeing, Hari. I, I feel this. Not really. No, I'm talking about the perception. It's not enlightened, basically. Why do you say that? Because I thought the enlightened one doesn't have fear. Otherwise, you would think you are still attach to body and mind. Otherwise, what is there to fear about? Um, he freaks out because it's hitting him very quickly um, on a massive scale. So, the fear is an interesting, it's an interesting point. Have you ever experienced too much of something at once, anything? Yeah, like a roller coaster, <laughs> <laughs> the big hill. Uh, Whoa, too much, big hill. Um, and <laughs> what, what's the net effect of it? Was it really too much? It felt like the motion. Yeah. At the time. And that's all you're dealing with here. Mm. Uh, but what's the net effect of it? You'll see. Yeah. <laughs> that's the effect of it. Mm. So it is as it, as it needs to be, and this, this is all as it needs to be. Um, he's He's, we could say awakening, or we could say awake. Um, but whenever we say awake, then somehow or other, we might presuppose what the way that's supposed to be. But how do we know? <laughs> well, we just know the descriptions that Krishna gave in the earlier chapters. Yeah. Um, does the ocean have waves, Harry? Yeah. Okay. Um, the waves are not separate from the ocean. Right. Correct. Uh, so could the waves of consciousness include waves of fear or, or other waves? Yeah. Uh, um, consciousness at the depth cannot be affected by them. Right? But at the surface, it, it appears to be, it seems to be. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, um, Krishna and Arjuna are one, really. Krishna said that earlier on, in fact, that amongst the, what did he say, amongst the warriors, I am Arjuna, like that. Uh, so, um, Is Arjuna's 
mind enlightened? Is his soul enlightened? Is it's a it's an interesting discussion, interesting question. Um, again, it's going to be a question of depth. Um, but certainly, he's coming to know if he doesn't know already that Krishna is the one reality wherever he goes. Um, um, does the fear actually affect him? That's an interesting question as well. I'm not. I'm not sure that it does because the fruit of it is is a broader, more all-inclusive opening mm -hmm. right. to what is. And then what we see is Arjuna in the battlefield, absolutely and completely fearless. So that somehow seems to be the fruit of all of this. Is the is the is what what do we see as an inner state for Arjuna? I feel when we get to the chapter, we see what the inner state of Arjuna is at that point. Here he's still being cooked. <laughs> right. Here he's still in the boiler. Um, but certainly the statements that he's making here. We, we could relate to is very much an intense awakening experience. Yeah. <laughs> right? Where I've been hearing you all this time, but now I'm really getting that you are this entire cosmos. This is all you. And, and some of these awakening experiences can be a bit freaky. <laughs> it's not dry anymore. Right. It's not having a conversation. I mean, we get to them through through purification of the of the intellect and working things out. But sometimes, when you work something out, it's shocking what you've worked out, <laughs> and and it has the potential to blow away everything that you thought you knew. And and there will be fear with that. Like, do I really go through with this? <laughs> do I really live my life in accordance with what I just worked out? <laughs> you have to give up attachments. Is that? that makes yeah. sense. So this this is where Arjuna is right, right now. <laughs> Maybe it's where we are too. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So okay. you're observing the fear rise and then go because it's seen and not felt. <laughs> Again, fear is fear is one of the waves, no doubt. Yeah. And um, recognize and release. Um, um, okay, we should close. Short final paragraph. Om Om Triambakam Yajamahe Surandim Pushti Vardhanam Tarai Rukameva Bandhanam Ritsor Mokshya Mam Ritat Om Triambakam Yajamahe Surandim Pushti Vardhanam Vorai Rukameva Bandhanam Ritsor Mokshiyamam Ritat Om Triambakam Yajamahe Surandim Pushti Vardhanam Orvai Rukhameva Bandhanam Ritsor Mokshiyamam Ritat Om Shanti 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 O adorable Lord of mercy and love, let us abide in Thee forever and ever. On below Sakura Rishiva Nanamarji Ki, and for all of the saints and sages of all the traditions. Yeah. Yeah. And let's rise for us.